Call the worship tonight's from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Very comforting words. Um, trust that helps us all. If that's all we get out of tonight, what a wonderful reminder, is it not, of God's mercy and his grace and how um, fatherly he is on a Father's Day. The ideal father, of course. Let's pray to our Father God. With so many great and precious uh, promises and uh, such a precious picture of your character and your goodness and your indeed steadfast love toward us. We do thank you that we can renew our trust in you tonight as we learn more about you as we worship you we thank you that you faithfully draw us unto you we do aim to lift up high your name lift up high your word and uh, we thank you for again your faithfulness in drawing us nigh to you amen amen let's uh, let's pray your picture we've just sung up, Lord, that surely the, the height or the, the greatest expression of your love was through your sacrificial death on the cross. And now you hold forth your wounded hands, your arms stretched wide, just as they would have been across, upon the cross. They are now stretched wide uh, for us, toward us, and of course, ultimately welcoming us as we will see you ultimately as you are. Thank you for that great picture. We thank you again for your love. Uh, we will read of it now. We trust we'll preach of it and hear of it. We pray that you'd make much of it in our hearts with our own affections for you. Burn a little deeper and a little brighter. Um, be a little more kindled toward you and less toward ourselves. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, turn with me, of course, to Romans chapter 8. To be honest, it wasn't really my intention to, to cover this passage as we're in this uh, series called Life in the Spirit, uh, but it felt just wrong to go through all of chapter 8 and, and not cover this uh, incredible passage. Uh, reading from verse 31, this is God's word. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's been a little bit of a journey for us as we've worked through chapter 8. A reminder that Paul ends chapter 7 with wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Casting a bit of a pall over the proceedings, isn't it? 
But he immediately does point toward hope in that last verse of, of chapter 7. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, now unpacks, of course, in Romans 8, what life, new life in this spirit looks like. And Romans 8 ends, in contrast to 7, with confident praise and adoration for the glory of God who has wrought so great a salvation of his people through Christ. This is an absolute gem of a chapter as a whole. It's a favorite chapter of many. And as I have found out, even amongst us in the fellowship, uh, some of the church sang so to me. It's certainly one of my favorite chapters in, in the scriptures. It's a wondrous summary of blessing and one of the great foundations, I believe, of Christian confidence. And that foundation is the supreme, steadfast, limitless love of God for his people. I don't think we can remind ourselves too much that God loves us. It is um, said that at the end of John's ministry, that is the Apostle John, love was the foremost thing on his mind. He was the one disciple that made a ripe old age and dying, not as a martyr, as we understand it. But love was his supreme uh, sort of clarion call in the last years of his ministry. I think all of us face challenges to our faith that would serve us or would be served well to remind ourselves of the God of love, accusations from outside of us, also accusations even from within us. And so we do well to really commit the truths found here, especially in verses 31 through 39. Commit these things to our hearts and to our minds to help steady us through seasons of challenge. And if we did, we would actually join a long line of Christians that have done that very same thing. Well, my structure tonight is really simple. Uh, the overhead projection is really simple, easy for Stuart to follow through tonight, uh, because I think we've got a clear structure from Paul the preacher. Five questions that Paul poses, five questions that forms the sermon tonight. They're questions in a way that the enemy of our soul will twist and turn and distort and actually use against us. The devil's wily. He's experienced in his ways. As experienced as you may be, you've not lived to tell as many lies as this guy has. And yet, posed as Paul poses them, these questions, when they're bathed actually in the light of God's truth and character, we see them swatting away the baseless, toothless accusations of a defeated foe. And collectively, this close, I think, of chapter 8 serves as a symphony of praise for the goodness of God and the sureness of your salvation tonight. So let's, without further ado, go to question one. Well, we find it straight away in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I love how Paul words this. What if he had said, who can be against us? Well, I suspect every hand would go up. Hey, I've got a few names. <laughs> who can be against us? All kinds of people can be against us. Every single reader of this letter or hearer of this letter being read would say, Paul, are you out of your mind? It would have been easier to ask who isn't against us, especially for those first century Christians. Just four verses later, actually, in verse 35, he lists persecution, danger, and sword, amongst other complications of being a Christian in the first century. These are other circumstances the church in Rome would have been totally familiar with. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, to them, this would have been written very a similar time period. He gives an account of some of the opposition he has faced. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, 
danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many, a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, by the way, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Now, Mike, that, can you relate to that last one? Hard to relate to that, in a way, pastor of one church, all the churches. So a staggering list of opposition that Paul has here. He's not coming at this from a Pollyannish point of view when he says who can be against us. The man was very well acquainted with opposition. Now, this kind of opposition is what comes to mind first, opposition to the faith and practice of Christians from people or authority outside the church. But besides all of that, we can be opposed to ourselves, can't we? Remember, we, like the earth, groan for the return of Christ. And so there is a sin against us, and we've read of some of that, but there's a sin within us that opposes us. There's decay all around us, and there's the decay of our own bodies. And all of this can work against us, it seems. You know, opposition to God is as old as humanity itself. In fact, predates humanity because the devil himself rose up to be God's equal. It's as old, as I said, as humanity, but it's also real. Paul's not denying that by this statement, but he places it in perspective, doesn't he? A perspective that renders the question unanswerable. That perspective is if. God is for us. If God is for us, who indeed can stand against us? Well, the answer is nobody. Nobody can. Is he for us? Well, by this point in Romans, the answer is undoubtedly yes. We are those who are called according to his promise, he's told us. We are those he foreknew. Remember last week, we called that foreloved. He foreknew us. We are those he predestined, justified, and ultimately will glorify, guaranteed. He says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One, of Israel, your Savior. All the powers of hell may do their worst. And sometimes the child of God experiences the worst of the storms. But God will always bring us through to the other side. It's not a question then of claiming God is on our side. Rather, that through Jesus we are now on his side, following where he leads and directs our paths. God is for us. I mean, one of the great promises, you could have come in here tonight at 629, accepted Christ, sat down, and what God says of you is he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. God is for you. Question two. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Again, what if the question was phrased just slightly differently? What if Paul had simply asked, will God give you all things? Well, I think you'd have to be kind of pathologically confident to answer that in the affirmative. Of course. He would give me all things. But our perspective, again, I think, changes as he draws our attention to the cross, and that's what he does. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Doesn't that render the following part of the question a little bit easier for us to answer? I hope it does. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He who did not spare his own son. You know, the devil loves to plant seeds of doubt in God's children. Um, 
in particular seeds of doubt with respect to God's character, God's goodness, God's love. And it goes all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? That's what that serpent did so effectively to undermine the character and the goodness of God. He knows that if you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open. What does that immediately do? Does that not call into question, hey, has God held something back from me? Questioning God's character and God's goodness. He's good at that. God holding back something that is good. And we listen to this kind of lie as well. Who amongst us hasn't at some point wondered, could God really love me? I mean, love me as much as my pastor says he loves me, as much as even the Bible tells me he loves me? Does he truly forgive me? Have you told yourself that one? Is he really for me? <clears throat> well, what is the basis that Paul uses to render this question almost silly? It's not a silly question. I don't mean it that way. I've just admitted probably all of us have had that thought. But when we see it again in the light of God's truth, it is rendered a silly question. The God you are wondering about, or the God who is the focus of the accusation that you listen to, is the God who gave his own son for you. I think when those first hearers or readers heard or read, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, surely cast their minds back to Abraham in, in Genesis 22. God asked Abraham if he was willing to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Genesis 22, 1, 2 says, sometime later, or, or sometime later than that, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. And he replied, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering, on a mountain that I will show you. Now we know that Abraham was obedient to that um, call. And later in the chapter, I think 16 or 17, by myself I have sworn, God says, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Ring a bell? And yet, Abraham, as we know, didn't even have to follow through on what he was willing to do in faith, willing to do at least. God was willing to make a greater sacrifice because he did send his only begotten son, and his son was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, to die in our place. There was no substitute for the son, the greater son. In fact, God says, or, or the word says, he gave him up for us all. It's not Judas that gave up <clears throat> Jesus. It was not the religious priests that gave up Judas. It was not the cowardly pilot who gave up Jesus. It was God the Father giving up God the Son, and he did it for you and in love. So in a way, Paul uses basic logic here. He's going from the greater giving to the lesser giving. If we can accept that greater giving, the giving of his own son, then how much more ought we to accept that he would give us good things? Why would he withhold the lesser from his children? God is for you, and he is a giver. Question three. <clears throat> who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And it's God who justifies. Now this question uh, is, I think, to bring to mind the, a law court setting. Who might bring a charge against you, Christian? Well, many, again, I think, might come to mind as give, bringing a charge against us. The devil, for one. I don't mean to make much of him, but... Um, I think it is important to understand how he twists and turns and, and makes us doubt the very faith that ought to be rock solid in us. Revelations 12.10 calls him the accuser of the brethren. And even his name actually means slanderer. The name, 
slanderer, his name the devil or Diablos. The devil can accuse us, bring a charge against us. How about others? Some of you chuckled when I said, can you think of some who might oppose us or you? Uh, we have enemies or adversaries um, who love to make accusation against us. And again, again, even ourselves, we can have our own conscience prick us and accuse us. The weight of accusation, one would think, would sway even the most generous of juries, if we're honest about ourselves. If, if the weight of every accusation, you know, could stand by paper behind us, and that's what we got to lug into the courtroom, in all honesty. Surely even the most generous jury, jury would call us guilty. And yet, because of Christ, every accusation, every legitimate accusation, frankly, comes to nothing. Why? Because God is the one who justifies. In fact, right in this verse, we see him. He's the one who has chosen us. We're called his elect. I think in this case, Paul perhaps has Isaiah 50 in mind, which says, he who vindicates me is near. God is near to you. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. I love that. In fact, the song we just sang, uh, the third verse, uh, calling home his father's children, holding forth his wounded hands, our vindicator, Christ. It's like he has in the courtroom when the charge goes against God's elect, he holds up that hand. He wants to stay in the proceedings, that pierced hand saying, no, not this one. This one's penalty has been paid. It's been paid in full. There is no charge that can stick against this man. No matter the charge, our advocate is near. Moreover, I think the emphasis on the justifier is important. It is God who justifies, Paul says. Uh, in our court system, I say our meaning here, I think it's the same as back in Canada. Um, in our court system, a defendant's first trial is set for a lower court, isn't it? And if he's deemed innocent, the Crown may still choose to appeal to a higher court. So that innocent verdict may in fact be overturned at a later date. But in this case, there's no option for that. The highest judge, the judge with the greatest authority has already deemed his elect innocent. What more could possibly be said? Question four, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, Romans 8.34. Again, there may be well many that who try or may wish to, but again, there is absolutely no ground remaining for such condemnation to stand upon. Not one inch. For all those sins, all those real sins that deserve real punishment have already been condemned. Jesus died for the sins we otherwise would die for. This, of course, is what we covered already in Romans 8 at the beginning of the chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation. That's present. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of, the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Again, this is sort of law court language. Um, there's a, a, a piece of law, I believe, called double jeopardy. You're not allowed to be tried for the same crime twice, double jeopardy. And so in a way, 
there's nothing left to condemn us because we are liberated. That all that condemnation, all that deserved condemnation has been laid on the sacrificial flesh of Christ. We cannot be tried for the same sin twice. God says there's no condemnation. Believe it. Nothing remains. <clears throat> Christ died. Christ was raised. Christ exalted. Christ now interceding. All of that we find in this great promise. It's not just that we are no longer condemned. Um, more than that, he says, Christ was raised. He was exalted. So in a way, we know that that sacrifice he brought into the Lord that ultimate once and for all sacrifice, blood on the altar, was accepted because he's now honored at the right hand of God. And then lastly, interceding for us. You know, the devil makes his life or living off of slandering you. Christ is ever interceding for us. Isn't that wonderful? Question five. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, <clears throat> we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. <clears throat> no, in all these things, <clears throat> we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love the Bible, and, and I would say often how much I love a particular passage. There are many lofty heights in scriptures, but none surely are higher than what Paul reaches here. Uh, Lloyd-Jones said, or he likened it to climbing a grand staircase. And from the top, we can survey all of the possible adversaries and again reach the same conclusion. No one or no thing can separate us from the love of God. Now, he perhaps speaks from his own experience as he lists seven candidates, right? Surveying that from that grand staircase. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. None are insignificant, yet each easily vanquished. Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. It's in verse 36 that he quotes from Psalm 44. And he tells us that such trials, or this tells us such trials are not new for the people of God. Not at all new. Verse 37 says that in all these things by which I suspect Paul is saying whatever separating force one could imagine. Not simply these seven things, any such thing you could imagine, we're more than conquerors. In fact, the word literally means in the Greek, literally super conquerors or super victors hyper nikomenen through him who loved us speaking of the challenges of the church through the ages from the writer of psalm 44 to early church leader john chrysostom he was uh, in the late fourth century and he was at one point brought before a roman empress named Eux uh, eudoxia and she threatened him with banishment if he didn't stop preaching the Christian gospel. Uh, if you know Chrysostom, he was, he was named Golden Throat because of his reputation in preaching. <clears throat> and they wanted him stopped. And so they threatened him with banishment. He said, you cannot banish me, for this world is my father's house. But I will kill you, said the empress. No, you cannot, for my life is hid with Christ in God. I will take away your treasures. Ah, no, you cannot, for my treasure is in heaven, and my heart is there. Ah, but I will drive you away from your friends, and you will have no one left. Oh, no, you cannot, for I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you, he said, for there is nothing you can do 
to harm me, not in any real sense. <coughs> verse 38 and 39 he just adds the exclamation point doesn't he for i am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of god in christ jesus our lord what's he saying not the sting of death not any allure of life that could distract no heavenly no earthly being Things past, not things past, not things to come, not the height of heaven, nor the depth of hell, nor anything else. Just in case he forgot something, not anything else. Even that which you fear the most, that Paul didn't think of, he covers. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. I mentioned this has been a favorite um, passage of many. Wesley, Wilberforce, you know those names, I suspect. You may not know Melanchthon, but if you want to know the brains behind Luther, Luther was the spit and vinegar. Well, the brains behind Luther was his dear friend, dearest friend, Melanchthon. All of them loved this passage. One example uh, was from 1660. So John Bunyan, of course, the author of Pilgrim's progress, found himself in quite a depressed state, wondering if he could go on, worrying about his future, when Romans 8.31 arrested his mind. I remember that I was sitting in a neighbor's home, and I was very sad. That word suddenly came to me. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? It's so simply stated, and I know it's hard to live. If it wasn't hard to live, I think we wouldn't all identify with that question I started with, or at least that acknowledgement that I started with. We probably at times, at some point in our life, have struggled to really receive the love of God or the forgiveness of God. Bathe yourself in these truths. These are the kinds of truths that anchor your soul to get you through the challenges of life that can be so real and so deep. Paul, again, is not dismissing or demeaning any challenge. Paul, of all people, knew challenges in this life. But, when he, but what he knew was the greater truth, was that he could not be separated from the love of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I, I do pray that we would, by remembering, by coming across this passage again, a passage well-worn, likely, perhaps even in our Bibles, well-worn. Um, we know it, but we know that knowing is tested by living. And I, I do pray that we would live out these truths, that we would live as if they were true that we would have a confident, um, confident expectation of your foreness for us, your love of us, your steadfast faithfulness toward us. We are the ones who are called by you, elect by you. We are justified and glorified by you ultimately. May these precious promises be so real to us that 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 other voice to us that can tempt us, that voice that can tempt us to doubt the goodness and the character of God, would you slay uh, that accusation just as you have slayed every one of the twisted questions that Paul was dealing with, those twisted accusations, such that we would rest with the sureness and the surety of our salvation. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness.
So go with that on your minds to give you peace and go in his love, for you are loved. Amen. Thank you.